Good evening. Welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video, we're going to talk about the dragon of Calvinism. The dragon of Calvinism. And we're not talking about we're not talking about the idea that Calvinism is a dragon, that it's really even formidable to be dealt with, because frankly it isn't. But there's something laying underneath. There's something underneath Calvinism which causes the the age old the centuries long debate to continue and i want to talk about that somebody's asking when i'm going to debate james white as soon as he formally invites me to do so and my fee is 250 dollars an hour so if you enjoy what you hear on this channel uh, we invite you to support us the details are in the description below we could not do this without support so if you like the content that we get here by all means please do support us so the dragon of Calvinism I want to talk about this concept of the dragon of Calvinism and I want to bring you on a journey that I have been going on since I started doing videos on Calvinism <sighs> The thing that's frustrating to me with with this issue is that Calvinism seems so open and closed. It's such an open and closed case. It's it's such a no-brainer. It does not make sense to me why why it would fool anybody or why people who uh, are who succumb to it would stay there. Why does that happen? The when you arrange the facts and ideas and interpret scripture in a consistent way, the idea that Calvinism is false is abundantly clear. So it is not, it is not obvious to me why, and I've been wondering this question for years, it's not obvious to me why. Why is it that despite being able to soundly refute Calvinism from so many different perspectives, people still persist in it, okay? Why? That, that's my question. So that's the question that I'm trying to, add, to, to answer. Why, why do people still persist in Calvinism even though there's no need to do so? I mean, when I talk with this issue, when I, when I discuss this issue with intelligent people who aren't really theologically embedded, they, it, it seems so stupid to them, even if they already understand it. Like I talked with somebody a couple of years ago who learned about Calvinism in college from a Calvinist professor, and it just seems so stupid to them. They, you know, why would you even entertain that for five seconds? And, <laughs> and why isn't everybody like that? And then I asked the same question, why did it get me for so long? I spent a while in, in Calvinism myself. Why did it get me for so long? So as I've been pursuing this, I really think that if we can answer this question correctly, we can perhaps, I, I think the centuries old debate can be ended if we address the real problem. And that's what I want to get to is what is the real problem? So that's what I want to talk about tonight. What's the real problem? What, what are we dealing with here? Let's peel back the layers of the onion and see really what we're dealing with here. There's a passage in 2 Corinthians 8, 7 that says, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance, and in knowledge and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. There is an abounding and there's, add to your faith, knowledge, and to knowledge of virtue. There is a, there is a knowledge and understanding component. And what I want to draw a, a, a quick parallel here is that, when we start talking about the mind and the in the human as a data processor, people all of a sudden stop paying attention to evidence and they just jump they jump straight to the Holy Spirit and demons and prayer and they just they just want to wish everything away and that's that's what we can't do we We cannot wish things away like the pattern of Jesus Christ, some problems are are complicated in their causality. They're not complicated in their solution, but they're complicated in their causality. And somebody has to take on voluntarily, take on the responsibility to address these problems where they are caused and not just wish them away and turn a blind eye. There are, there are people hurting. 
There are families being separated. There are churches being split. There are people confused about God. I, I can't tell you how many people, how many people I get emails from where they're coming out of Calvinism and they're telling me they, they were, it just zapped all their joy. It zapped all their joy and they thought Calvinism was true, but they couldn't be a joyful Christian. And they're so happy to find out that scripture is true and not Calvinism and their joy and their peace are restored. I can't tell you how many people that's happening to. Um, so this really is a bad thing, but but at the same time, it is it is kind of a surface level issue. There are much deeper issues that need to be dealt with. So as I chase the rabbit trail down, I found out that there are layers of the onion that need to be peeled back, and 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 you gotta as you peel them back, it seems like there's always something else. There's always something else. There's always something else. So I kind of want to share with you tonight some of the things that I have found that if if these things were taken care of as a prophylaxis, in other words, if people could do good sense making and they studied epistemology and they studied logic and they were of good mental health and things like that, if they could do these things, then they would not be susceptible to Calvinism. And Christians do not have a problem listening to a secular person when it comes to nutrition or things like that. When somebody, when a doctor tells you, hey, you need to eat right, uh, you need to stop eating so much fat and sugars and stuff, and you start you need to start eating lean meat and more vegetables and fruit. We don't have a problem with a secular person telling us that, but when somebody has research about how the mind works, suddenly we put that into a different category. Like we don't need to listen to them or pay attention to any of their evidence or anything like that because you know it's all it's all demons and prayer and the Holy Spirit, and that's that's all that is, and we don't need to know anything about it. Well, I need to break a, a really cold, hard reality to you, is that understanding how the mind works as a human data processor is extremely important as a Christian because we deal with information. And you need to know how your body it acts as a data processor. You need to know how it works. Just like if you were responsible for processing data on a machine, you would need to know how that machine works so that you can make adjustments when necessary. Sometimes our, our human bodies, they, they process data incorrectly. And then even apart from where we would wish them to, we need to find out why, okay? So a vocabulary word for today, jejun. Jejun, naive, simplistic, superficial. A lot of people just want to wish this kind of stuff away and pretend that it's not a problem. I'm asking you to not be that kind of Christian, but to realize what this is. If I could get, not just me, but if we can get enough Christians to really pay attention to the real problem, then Calvinism can actually go away. Not just Calvinism, but a lot of other false doctrines. See, Calvinism isn't really, really the problem itself. Calvinism is an artifact. It's a byproduct. It's an unintended consequences of many other things going wrong at a different level. So if we can go, if we can dial back and see what those other things going wrong are, we can put a stop to Calvinism ever, people ever being susceptible to Calvinism in the first place or any other kind of false doctrine, which might include some doctrine that you believe as a listener, because I don't know who you are. This made me think of Calvinism. So I had to put it up here. I want to talk to you about water around my toilet. <laughs> and here's, I'm going to explain to you the concept of a dragon. Think of a, think um, of the concept of water around your toilet. Now, this happened to me recently in this wonderful house in which Paula and I live. Recently, I discovered that there was water around the downstairs toilet. So I'm, uh, I started looking into it. And I wasn't exactly sure what it was. That's not important. The point is this, though. When something happens, it could be something simple, like some of the hoses and valves, maybe they just need to be tightened up. Maybe there's a leak in the basin. Maybe you can just replace an O-ring. So the, the, the more you inquire, the more that you might discover is wrong. Okay? Um, it could be coming from underneath the toilet. It could be like... The, the flange and the wax seal might be bad. There could be a crack in the porcelain throne itself. There could be a crack in the basin. 
All we know is that there's water on the toilet. And, or it could be like a leak from the ceiling that just happens to be landing right there. It might not even be coming from the toilet. It might be coming underneath the wall from something else that's leaking. could be a pipe in the wall coming out from underneath the wall. could be so many things. Now, the worse it is, imagine the worst thing it could be, that's your dragon. That's your dragon. The easiest thing that it could be is not a dragon. But when problems get ignored, say, say just say, for whatever reason, water just splashed out of the toilet. I know this is a gross thing to talk about, isn't it? Water just splashed out of the toilet happened to be happened to be on the floor. And you discovered that, that that's what happened. There's no leaks. There's no cracks. There's nothing like that to worry about. That would be good news, okay? You could just wipe up that mess, clean that mess up. Your problem is over. And now... But if it's something else, then you got to figure out what it is. Eventually, you're getting tools. Eventually, you know, you're getting tools and flashlights. And maybe you're even calling a plumber. And before you know it, maybe you're paying thousands of dollars to get something fixed. You never know. You never know what it's going to be. And that, that thousands of dollars scenario, that's the dragon. That's what's underneath. It's, it's the cause of the water. Now, what we've been doing when we handle Calvinism is we've been... For centuries, why is the debate going on for so long? Because we've just been wiping up the water. That's all we've been doing. We have not been doing any kind of investigation to see what kind of messed up thinking people are doing that makes them susceptible to Calvinism in the first place. What is that dragon? So here's another picture of a guy having water on the floor as a problem. Now let me give you another idea. Now Jordan Peterson uses this example. He has a couple of illustrations about uh, a dragon and one of them he uses is a lamp and the idea of a dragon it's like the worst thing you can imagine it's a, it's a cat bird snake it's a predatory cat bird snake and it's not something that you would want to encounter and uh historic you know you got these dragon slayers when you look back through history the the big strong guy can go kill the dragon and it's because it's a tough problem and nobody is uh, evidently equipped to do so and whoever can do it they write legends and stories about them so killing the dragon is a big deal so he gives the illustration of uh of like turning on the lamp to read you turn on a lamp to read and then the lamp doesn't come on and so okay well i probably just need to change the light bulb so you change the light bulb it still doesn't come on now you're troubleshooting the lamp now you're troubleshooting the <laughs> Is everything okay in the lamp? Is it put together well? It, what about the outlet? What about plugging into the outlet? Does the lamp work in other outlets? Does that outlet work with other appliances? And then if not, what about the breaker? Does the breaker trip? And then if that's not the issue, what else might be the issue? Um, do we have a short in the house? And then all the way... <laughs> And then maybe you're paying thousands of dollars for an electrician to come in and get into your walls and cut holes in the walls and find these wires and find out where they're broken and fix them, all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> or run new wires. So that's the dragon. That's the dragon. So the, a problem left unattended for too long, whether you know about it or not, you could be ignoring a known problem. Or you just might not know about a problem and the problem persists in the background, getting worse and worse and worse until pretty soon it manifests itself. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it is, it is this huge, big problem. That is the proverbial dragon that we're talking about. And so as you peel back the layers of the onion and you encounter a problem and you start trying to find out what the issue is, when it comes to Calvinism, most of the stuff against Calvinism, and yes, the other YouTube channels, all that stuff, all the books you can get, all they're doing is changing light bulbs and wiping up water. That's all they're doing. And, and that's all that the Calvinism debate people, that's all they've been doing for a while, for centuries. And that's why the problem persists. And that's why people think that this has just been going on for centuries and centuries and there's nothing you can say or do to stop it. Well, maybe it's going to persist somewhere, like, and I'm not, I'm not drawing a direct connection, but Nazism is persisting somewhere, but it's negligible in size, okay? But I, I think we can make it go away, and, and even if we can't make it less prominent, we could actually solve it for, help solve it for certain people, for individuals, for some families, for some churches. We can make a difference, but the... 
<laughs> we could make such a bigger difference if more people would realize what a problem this is and undertake the responsibility to do something about it, to, to stand up, to speak out, to say something, to address this issue. Which means you're going to have to do some work on yourself. You're going to have to find out what's going on. So my question has been for years, what causes people to be duped by something that is so obviously demonstrably false? And it turns out, I mean, that, that, is a real, that really plagues me. And another way you could say this, how, how could people be so dumb? You know, I could understand if it was a convincing lie. It's, it's not even convincing, okay? And it turns out the answer to this question is extremely involved. Now, while the prescription seems very simple, the cause analysis reveals a much different story. Now, I know, I know the prescription is simple. I know a lot of you, when you see what I'm going to start talking about, you're going to start saying, well, there's simplicity in Christ. Yes, that's, that's the problem. You see, not, a, not the problem, but that's the issue. That's my question. There is simplicity in Christ. So the solution, the prescription is very simple. Just believe the Bible. But why is it that people are claiming to do so and aren't? Well, they're deceived, right? There's self-deception. There's imposed deception. Now, what, what is it that causes people to be deceived? What is it that causes people to believe things that aren't true? And even if somebody doesn't believe the Bible's true, what is it that causes somebody to believe the Bible saying something that it is not trying to say? Put it that way. What, what is it that causes that to happen? So yes, basic epistemology is very simple. If this was taught by kids... If epistemology was taught in the classroom, and I was just talking to my wife about this earlier today, um, we would not have problems with this kind of nonsense in churches. We would not have these artifacts and anomalies popping up. Calvinism would not happen. We would not be susceptible to it. So, But what is preventing people from being able to do very basic epistemology? What is preventing people from being able to do that? So we're going to look at the truth. The truth, it is simple. The truth is simple. The solution is rather simple from our perspective. And the causes of deception and self-deception are very multifaceted. That's what you need to understand. And we're going to look at those multifaceted things. And what I want to do today is raise your awareness of them so that as you endeavor to take on the responsibility for the dragon that is underneath the water spill of Calvinism or the burned out light bulb of Calvinism, that you can have an idea of some of the things that you can help start looking into to prepare yourself to better address the root causes of this issue. And the good news is this. When you do this, you will not just be addressing problems with Calvinism. You will be addressing problems with any kind of ideological possession. And the skills that you learn when doing this can be applied anywhere. Anywhere. under With regard to any kind of falsehood. Or any kind of person who's ideologically possessed. So we need to know what we're up against. A problem well-defined is half-solved. And the problem with Calvinism is that it is not, it is not well-defined. Um, we think it's this surface-level stuff. We, we think wiping up the water is going to solve. No, the problem is not well-defined. We need to find the problem. There's, some, <coughs> there's something happening in the data processing capabilities of human beings that makes them susceptible to believe dumb things. Right? That's what we need to find out what it is. So we raise awareness of this and the causes of deception and self-deception. Why? For ourselves, so we don't fall prey to it. Now, to understand human information processing, you need to know that. To prevent deception, now as like a prophylaxis. Prophyl That's a preventative. A preventative kind of thing so that you can stave off getting sick, okay? Like when it comes to COVID, I've, uh, I take a few over-the-counter things that would prevent me from getting that if I were to encounter it as a prophylaxis to, and, and, there's, uh, and stop you from getting the cold and the flu or stop it from being bad as well, too. A vaccine is a prophylaxis, okay? Now, I don't want to get into that debate, but just think of other vaccines <laughs> if that's the issue. To have a resilient toolkit when interacting with other people on a variety of domains, not just Calvinism, but that's what led me. The Calvinism issue is what caused me to dig deeper, which is why we're going to deal with it from that perspective. So we can teach the next generation, and for the sake of prevention, and I know some of these overlap, they're reworded the same way, like to prevent, to prevent prevention, yeah, prophylaxis, same thing. It doesn't hurt us to see it twice. So some combination of the following. What following? Okay, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of things. Okay. 
some combination of the following things. <laughs> All right. What I want to do now is I need to fix I need to fix something that's happening to my my poor dear screen here and now it's better so I'm going to show you a whole bunch of things in a minute and the, and the problem the reason I'm giving you all this because it's this is uh, this could be daunting because there's so many things and this uh, they may seem so confusing and so daunting but I'm writing them down so that we'll be able to see them all right so some combination of the following must be in place before Calvinism has fertile ground where it can grow. In other words, of all these things that I have jotted down here, something has to have gone wrong. A few of these have to have gone wrong, or a person has to be unprepared in several of these areas in order for Calvinism to be able to take root in a person. Okay, And my vision is that if we could, if we could understand the landscape, and then we could make the soil of humanity, unfertile ground for Calvinism or for any other kind of deception or ideological possession. We could do this. So as a data processor, are we ready to start looking at some of these? And I don't even know if we're going to have time to get through these, and I don't even know how long I'm going to talk. But I thought about, I'm going to introduce the concept of the underlying dragon of Calvinism, what the, real, the underlying issues that make it possible for people to be deceived into Calvinism. We're going to address this topic and then I'm thinking about having, having a discussion with some other people from Beyond the Fundamentals that join us on Wednesday nights, have a discussion of these things, um, and we'll take them slow. We'll take them one at a time and do something like that. Let me see where we are on the comments. <clears throat> so we've got a few comments out there. Now... <clears throat> now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some things. Um, so why is it? Why is it that a Calvinist will say sola scriptura and then quote from the London Baptist Confession where they say scripture is the authority and then believe things that are absolutely contrary to scripture? Why is that? So we're going to look at the mind as a human data processing issue. Uh, here's, the, this, here's the stuff in black, and here's the stuff in red. So what I thought about, uh, it looks like I moved some of this stuff around a little bit. So what I thought about doing is looking at some of these in red, we'll mention them, and then as we talk about them, we can turn them green. Um, so one thing I encourage people to look into is moral foundations theory. When somebody starts talking, um, by Jonathan Haidt, it is a book called The Righteous Mind. I encourage people to look at that. And people get into this issue of a divine ethic. And I want to encourage you to do this. There are some things that we do and we don't do strictly because we believe a divine authority told us that we should and shouldn't. And I want you to take I want you to take it mentally one step further. Don't just obey that. And I'm not telling you not to obey. I'm not telling you disobey. I'm telling you don't just obey it. But also think about the reasoning why. God would say to do something or not to do something. Think about the reason why, okay? And when you're dealing with other people who don't necessarily think Scripture is true or who don't believe in the God of the Bible or who are Calvinistic and they don't, <laughs> they claim to believe the Bible but don't, um, the, understanding the why behind why God might say a certain thing other than just some kind of plot, God is holy and his ways are higher than our ways. I know, I know all that stuff, okay? Don't go there. I want you to think about practical things that you can articulate with other people. Why might God say a particular thing? And then, this is going to show up a bunch of times. Moralistic beliefs. We have beliefs about some things that are just factual. Just factual. Like the height of a certain kind of cloud and then how much it weighs before it starts dispensing precipitation. Nobody's going to argue about that kind of stuff. You can just measure that kind of stuff. It's just factual. But there's certain things that we believe that we feel like we are morally superior. And this gets into ideology right here. So I'm going to go ahead and transition. I'm going to mark this one off. <laughs> and ooh, we're going to have to do like a dark green. 
Yeah. There we go. Because it's uh, green on white. We'll go ahead and mark this one off. And so what they do, when someone, in ideology, when you, the, one of the ways you can tell that somebody is an ideologue, and I recommend the book, How to Have Impossible Conversations, by um, Peter Boghossian and James Lindsay. It's, there's moralism that's tied to ideology. See, ideology is not just a set of ideas that somebody thinks is true. They have identified with it emotionally, and they think that they are morally superior for holding and affirming those sets of beliefs. And we joked around on our channel a little bit about the beliefs that people affirm. Okay, We have a little statement that I think is on the website now. If it's not, it's going to be there soon. So moralism. Ideologues believe that they are morally superior for the beliefs that they hold. And now that, that kind of connects us into the idea of something that we have been calling a NERC on this channel. So framing in the NERC. If, if I can draw your attention over here. What is NERC? It's a non-epistemic ranking criteria. So as soon as somebody knows that you think that you're more moral, or they think something is more moral, they'll, ter they'll start talking in terms of moralistic values rather in term rather than in terms of the facts okay what are some christian values that we have we have values about humility and pride and thankfulness um th those kinds of things giving glory to god right so what a calvinist is going to do since the data isn't on their side they're going to frame things in a in a value driven moralistic way to make it seem like it is more virtuous and a higher value and more moral to affirm what they are saying. I don't argue about election. I just thank God that he chose me. See what they did? They just, they just swapped over from whether or not the Augustinian version of election is truer than the biblical version, which is how that should be worded. And they switched it over to whether or not you're thankful. See what they did? And of course, you want to be thankful, and so you go with the one that makes you look thankful, and they just got you, okay? They just use your own values to deceive you into something that they did not have uh, a non-epistemically warranted argument for, okay? They did not have solid grounds, a substantive grounds for something to be claimed as true, but when they start mixing values in and it messes with your emotions, you don't know how your data processing center works, and so then you get limbically hijacked. So these guys, <clears throat> we dealt with this, <clears throat> and then you get limbically hijacked. What is limbically hijacked? Yeah, your limbic system in the back of your brain. I'm not a scientist, and I don't claim to understand all of this, but if there are things that tend to make you mad or upset. Let's say, let me give you an example. Somebody burning the American flag and stomping on it, okay? That could make you limbically hijacked. It'll make you angry about uh, there's a sanctity degradation kind of moralistic feeling that you would have and that could make you angry. And so if somebody wanted to make you angry, they could show you things like that or show you people tearing up a Bible or tearing pages out of it or using it to do profane things. <laughs> um, limbic hijacking. Or they could swap things around. They could, um, they could show you pictures of uh, police officers beating people up. Or they could show you pictures of police officers saving kittens out of trees. Okay, And you could be limbically hijacked in a positive way and in a negative way. And it's, it's your responsibility. Now, when you are on social media, especially social media... Your, those algorithms on there are designed to keep you on site. Time on site is how they aggregate their ad revenue, okay? So they want to keep you there as long as possible. If they can make you very happy or laughing or like very satisfied, like righteously indignant, you know all those people that repost those political memes <laughs> or if they can, like anything to cat videos, anything that'll keep you watching, anything that'll keep you there, anything to make you angry, watching the cops beat people up, watching people burn and stomp on the American flag or tear up Bibles or something like that. They, they will get to you and they will limbically hijack you. And so you want to be aware of this and you want to be able to spot when it's happening and you don't want them to be able to do that to you. <clears throat> 
um, recognize when somebody is pushing your buttons. That's another, you know, that's what you tell your kids. You know, don't let them have control over your emotions. Don't let them limbically hijack you. Now, over here, let's go back over here to this side and talk about rivalry for a second, okay? Everywhere there is Calvinism, everywhere there is ideological possession, there is rivalry beneath and behind and underneath it that led up to it, okay? Now, the rivalry very specifically that generated Calvinism was Augustinian's rivalrous approach with Pelagius. There was not a collaborative approach. There was a rivalrous approach. And whenever you have a rivalrous reproach with regard to data, you wind up getting data that is, let's see, where did I put this? <laughs> right down here. You wind up getting data that is more adaptive to rivalrous victory. And in, so, so what am I saying here? In a rivalrous environment, the meme complexes or paradigms or ideologies or data sets or systematic theologies, you want to say it that way when I say ideology and paradigms, talking about stuff like this, stuff that you think is true without having read through it, the ones that survive in a rivalrous dynamic and a rivalrous landscape are the ones that are good at rivalry, not the ones that are true necessarily. If they happen to be true, it's an accidental collision. It's an accidental convergence. It, there's no correlation whatsoever between idea sets that thrive in a rivalrous environment versus idea sets that actually are true. There's no correlation whatsoever. And so one of the worst things you can have, people are always asking, when are you going to debate so-and-so? When are you going to debate so-and-so? <laughs> That's the problem with debate. Not to mention, look up where debate shows up in Romans one twenty nine, and see if you want to do any of those other things in there. We don't want to be in a rivalrous dynamic. If you can be with somebody else who disagrees with you, but you are both collaborating and you are in good faith and you both both are earnestly endeavoring to discover the truth regardless of where it leads, that's what you should be doing with other people. That's what Pelagius and Augustine should have done. But no, they turned it rivalrous and then it stays rivalrous ever since. So that's not what we want to do. So rivalry, rivalry is very bad. You want to strive for anti-rivalry and anti-fragility, okay? So memetics, when we talk about memetics, I have a couple of pictures here. Like here's a, here's a Christian meme complex, okay? It's, it's just an example. This is just me throwing a bunch of ideas on a slide that you hear in church and in theology. So the whole collection of all the ideas that are part of Christianity form the meme complex, okay? So when I start talking about memetics, it is the study of the kinds of ideas that form meme complexes and how they do three things, um, specifically how they propagate themselves, how they endure and persist, and how they defend themselves. You know, because the meme, <laughs> they have to defend themselves against outsiders and they have to endure, which means they have to defend themselves against the people who are adherents of the, of the meme complex, of the doctrine if you will. They don't want those people to come to the cognitive level of awareness whereby they start to doubt the central meme of the meme complex. Okay, So a meme complex will do well if it survives in a rivalrous environment regardless of whether or not it's true. So you need to understand what the meme complex of Christianity is and how the sub-meme complex of Calvinism is to the Christian meme complex, it's parasitic. It's parasitic. It has to have the Christian meme complex as a host, and then it has to be the unclean fowls lodging in the branches of the mustard tree. Okay? It has to have people say, well, we believe in Christianity. No, they have to have Christianity in place to tack. And so Calvinism, to, to tack their distinctives on there. Calvinism has very specific distinctives. And they are unique. You can have Christianity without Calvinistic distinctives. So what are the Calvinistic distinctives doing there? What are they doing there? Memetics. Memetics. They were victorious and rivalrous in a rivalrous arena. 
um, mem- memetics. That's how it happens. We don't want that. We don't need that to happen. So rivalry is not good. And people who succumb to it, if you think that debate is a good way of deciding whether or not something is true, you are subject to this kind of problem. You're, you don't understand how the human mind works. So what happens when people encounter ideas that they don't believe in? Okay. Um, go over here to polyvagal theory on the right hand side. And I'm also looking for, (laughs) I just threw a bunch of stuff up here. I'm looking for where we become, um, attached. We have a, we get attached to our meme complexes. All right. And so I know I have this up here somewhere and probably some of you see it. But when you're attached to your meme complexes, and look at this polyvagal theory over here, um, what does that mean? You have a vagus nerve, and when something happens, when you encounter something, you either are open to it or you are defensive against it. And it is one or the other, you can't be both. And whenever I tell that to people, they're like, well, I can be both because blah, 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 blah. No, you can't. You can't be both, okay? You have to be one or the other. Now, you can manage it. You can manage it. What that means is if you are aware, when somebody starts, say you're attached to certain beliefs and somebody starts attacking your beliefs and then you get defensive. Now from that point forward, especially if you're in a rivalrous rivalrous arena, you are not going to be able to recall facts and data and be open and collaborative and be earnest. You can't be earnest when you're defensive. You can't. So... You have to prevent yourself from becoming defensive, which means you need to stay out of rivalrous scenarios and be more in collaborative scenarios, all right? And not offensive. I didn't mean to say offensive here. I meant to be, meant to be openness, okay? Openness. You can be defensive or open. You can't be both. You want to be open. Now, there's certain techniques that you can do, like you can breathe very deeply out your nose, and they say that if you breathe very deeply out your nose and hum, something like that, while you're breathing out your nose, um, and you're thinking about what's going on, and you're aware of what's going on, that you can actually re-regulate yourself so that you can become open again, even though you were just attacked. (laughs) So you need to understand what's going on there. I mean, the same thing's happening to you. If you're out in the woods and you get encountered like you're suddenly the prey animal, suddenly a, you know, a jaguar is right in front of you and it's about to jump at your throat, you're going to be in defense fight or flight mode. Or if something jumps in front of you, say a, a small kitten jumps in front of you and it looks like it's hungry, you're going to be in openness mode. You're going to try to call it to you and pet it, things like that. And that's appropriate. Those are appropriate responses. What happens when somebody attacks idea sets that you are attached to is that you go into defensive fight or flight mode. That's what happens. You need to know that. You want to be in open mode, but it's very difficult when somebody's on the attack. Now, another thing that goes in with this, and we'll go ahead and turn this one green, is to be attached in the first place. You don't want to be attached in the first place. Okay? When you're, when you're emotionally attached to things... You have a fear attached with losing them, and then you have an anger when that happens, and then you have resentment, and resentment is the, that opens the floodgates for you to no longer have any discernment about what is true and what is false, okay? And so you go back to the attachment. Attachment precedes fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. There, you don't want to be attached to idea sets. You need to have idea sets and hold them in possibility space. Be able to look through different paradigms, but don't feel like you own anyone or anyone owns you. You are not it, and it is not you. Do not identify yourself with it. If you are a premillennial dispensationalist or anything like that, don't call yourself that thing. Hold that as a view in possibility space. Maybe it has a high confidence margin assigned to it, according to what you know. Maybe it has a low one, okay? But don't don't make it part of yourself. Don't make your belief sets part of yourself. Do not do that. We don't want to become attached to these things because they, then they can be hijacked against us. Um, 
So where do I want to go from here? I think I need to tackle this big one here. Truth. I've been raised in a Christian home all my life, or a nominally Christian home all my life. I believe I've been raised in a Christ, in a home that was following a Christ, uh, one of the Christian belief systems all my life. That's probably a better way to say it. I've it, at this point in my life, I've come to the point where I now see that Christianity, base Christianity, is meta to any of the belief systems that claim to be it, and it is not any of the belief systems. Um. So yeah, tell the truth, tell the truth. And I didn't understand that telling the truth, there was a lot more to it than that. And also there's a feeling that comes along with telling the truth. Jordan Peterson likes to, he actually opened my eyes more so than any other religious teaching I ever had that helped me really nail down when I was telling the truth and to know it and to stop not doing it, to stop being dishonest and deceitful with myself and with other people. That helped me more than all this religious teaching I got, all that did was teach me to virtue signal, but it didn't give me any skill sets. So when you learn that when you tell a lie, you feel weak, you feel like you can't defend yourself, and you can feel it in your body, and you can sense a set of emotions when it happens. And then when you tell, when you say something that you know is true, then you have a different set of emotions, and you learn to start tell your body. Your emotions are body up, your thoughts are cognition down, Okay. So when your emotions are talking to you, you need to learn how to calibrate them. You need to learn how to interpret them. Now, they're not driving the train, but they are an input to the process of sense making. And you need to know how to read those inputs and you need to calibrate them over time. Okay. What I did not know was that I thought of telling the truth as like not lying, like not misrepresenting something that happened, whether or not I saw something happen or that kind of thing. But then it it grew and grew to encompass the idea that when I repeat the talking points of a narrative that is not mine, for example, if I haven't studied out eternal security doctrine that the Baptists believe, but I stand up and preach it and I learn it and I learn to repeat it, I have become a meme propagator and I have started to, I'm polluting the information ecology because I'm saying things that I haven't validated myself, I haven't self-validated to be true, okay? And so it's important to don't, it's important not to say anything that you haven't actually epistemically validated yourself. And when you do, if you do want to present something, you present it as a possible view held by the Baptists, not as something that you think is dogmatically true, well, the Baptists think this, this, and this, and here are some of the arguments for it. And I have, I give it a 73% confidence margin that they know what, that kind of thing, okay? Or here's some arguments that I thought of for it and against it. So that, I, I realized that I was a meme propagator. I was spout, I was repeating other people's ideas that weren't mine. And I realized that that was a lie too. And sometimes you can lie just because you lack the articulation skill. Maybe the truth is detailed enough to where you don't have the articulation skill to say it accurately and with fidelity. And then when you try to repeat it, you're lying because you're not doing a very good job of it. That's a way of lying. <laughs> Honesty. Um, understanding articulation skill. How well do you understand something? If you don't understand something, but you're trying to repeat it, you will inadvertently lie about it. Not because you're trying to be deceptive, not because you're dishonest, but just because you shouldn't be doing that. And Calvinists, that is exactly what Calvinism is. They are constantly repeating a paradigm that's been handed down to them. They haven't done the epistemic work behind it, or otherwise they wouldn't be Calvinists. That's what you call a Calvinist who has done the epistemic work behind the things that they believe in an honest and earnest way. What you call them is a former Calvinist. That's what they wind up being. And that goes with any kind of ideological possession. And the relationship between virtue, and I say virtue, I'm not talking about rule following. I'm talking about the genuineness of the self and what it really is. Ideology clogs the Logos conduit. The Logos wants to flow through you but your ideology, like, like a, say you're a conduit, like a water hose or something, the Logos wants the Jesus Christ, the essence of who Christ is, wants to flow through you to other people, but your ideology is clogging it up. 
and you wind up virtue signaling instead of being virtuous and you are uh, like like the concept in the east of dharma the thing that you should be and should be doing not rule following so you wind up polluting the information ecology by repeating things that you hear on a regular basis you need to put your faith and work in the you need to put your faith and trust in the finished work of jesus christ well how many times have you ever heard that or the finished work of jesus christ on the cross well christ's work wasn't finished when he was on the cross so why would somebody say that you know that it sounds right because you hear it a lot, and because Christ said the phrase, it is finished while he's on the cross, it, that all sounds like it goes together, but it doesn't go together. You weren't, <laughs> I'm not going to get into all that. Plenty of videos where we talk about that. Repeating unearned ideas, ideas from other people. You didn't do the epistemic work behind it to get to these ideas. Resentment. So I, I can't stress enough the, the relationship between resentment and the inability to discern, and the propagation of lying, and the antidote to that is responsibility, thankfulness, and you responsibility and truth, and resentment and lies. They are they are on opposite poles. They go apart from each other, and resentment and bitterness. And when you can't forgive people, and you wind up entertaining. Huh, a narrative that will harm the object of your resentment regardless of how untrue the narrative is. So now you've lost your relationship with your capacity. You've lost your relationship with truth. Resentment is, if, if the devil wasn't a person or a personality in the Bible, resentment would be the devil. Resentment in your life in your head is the father of all lies. Everything that you ever believed that was a lie is tied to some kind of resentment somewhere. Okay? I promise you that. Um, and then responsibility. Now, don't just repeat that because I said it. Responsibility is one of the ways that we counteract this kind of thing. The, the resentment. You start, even though it was, even though the bad thing in your life really was somebody's fault, somebody else's fault, you take the responsibility to make the situation better, okay? I'm in a situation right now where uh, there's, a, there's an event coming up in two weeks and somebody has the power to make everybody else suffer. Four hours worth of suffering for no good reason, just because they can, okay? Now, I could fight that battle or I could, even though it's not my fault and it's completely their fault, I can just take the responsibility to do what I can to make things better anyway, even though they are wrong, okay? Even though it's their fault. That's, that's, and so that's what I'm going to do. And the, the value of trying to follow Christ, that's what he did. He took on responsibility for something that wasn't his fault, even though somebody eaten up with bitterness and resentment was trying to make things as worse as they possibly could, you can put a stop to that by taking responsibility to make things better, okay? So despite wanting revenge, despite all those kinds of ill feelings that you might have somebody toward whose fault it is, just take the responsibility to make things better for everybody. And don't worry about whose fault it is. And that we need a world full of people like that. That's what we need to see. That's what we need to have happen. We talk about beliefs, belief systems see where I want to go next. This is a big one here. Outgrouping and ingrouping. <clears throat> here's ingrouping over here. And here's outgrouping over here. What a Calvinist will do when they start talking about Calvinism, what they will, one of the things they will frequently do first is they will mention something that is in opposition to them. Like, Arminianism, or Synergism, or the Bethel Movement, or the Name It, Claim It crowd. And they will present themselves like they are the only option to avoid false doctrine. Now what they do when they do this, as soon as they open the... Arminians will say, by the way, we non-Calvinists, we are not Arminians. Okay? Calvin was dead at the sign out of Dort. So what you have in Calvinism, really... Arminians are part of Calvinism. You have Arminian Calvinists and you have 
Bayesian Calvinists, like Theodore Beza, was presiding over the Synod of Dort. Okay? So you have Beza Calvinists, and the five points are of Calvinism are Bayesian Calvinism, and then the five points of Arminianism are really Arminian Calvinism. He was a Calvinist. Okay? Anybody who's a Bible believer who's trying to follow what Scripture says, you don't need to follow any one of those people. You don't need to follow Beza, Calvin, or Arminius. And Ar- Arminius and Calvin are not opposites. Okay? It is a, Arminianism is a variation of Calvinism. He, he was trying to prove, he spent his life trying to prove what a good Calvinist he was and how much he adhered to the Heidelberg Confession and all this other stuff. He's a Calvinist. But what they do, when the, these modern-day Calvinists, they'll say, Arminius will say, now, wh- what do they just do when they say that? They automatically created two groups, you're in one, and the they. The they are othered, and they are out there, and they are bad, and you need to get rid of them. They are the they. And <laughs> when you look at group dynamics, human, human nature, we tend to you know, cluster around our groups and we get defensive and protective and we want to feel like we're part of our group. We want all that stuff to happen. They've done experiments where they separate people into groups just based on a coin toss. And then as the as the experiments continue, they'll find that one group is willing to take measures to punish another group just because they're in the out group. <laughs> right? So that's not a good way to do things. You have like a Hobbesian nightmare. You have an us, us versus them. You have a punishment propensity. I mean, the Calvinists want to see Arminians that they think everyone's an Arminian who isn't a Calvinist. They want to see them suffer. They just they want to like destroy them and show them and this kind of stuff. And that's no. We need to get in the situation where we're not all against each other and teamed up against each other, but we collaborate and we are earnest and we're trying to find truth together not antagonize each other and we come together in good faith and we are not ideologically possessed okay so if you are a calvinist you um you have to be susceptible to in-group out-group manipulation is one of the things of, of these things in order to be a Calvinist. I don't know how many things are on here. I haven't counted them. But if you are a Calvinist, if you are a Calvinist, you you probably have to have about half of these things wrong in order to become a Calvinist in the first place. Okay? And so that's what we're getting to. So this and I'm gonna I'm gonna take a break here. We're probably gonna do a part two. And on the part two, now that you see where I'm going, I might bring some other people in to chat with me about this on uh on the video but (laughs) the mind as i'm searching through calvinism and i'm trying to find out why people believe dumb things this is what i've found this is what i've found there's people people have they're messed up in all of these areas and that's is that is what leads and makes them susceptible to deception that's what makes them able to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine if um if i go to say ephesians chapter 4 verse 14 and um that we henceforth not over here but over here that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, but a slight of men by cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. If you are ideologically possessed, even if you are not trying to, you are deceiving somebody, even if it's just yourself, every time you run your mouth. Every time you run your mouth, you're introducing pollution into the information ecology. And um, like one of the issues is conclusion-based theology. That's one of the big issues right there. Uh, what am I talking about? Being tossed about to and fro with every wind of doctrine is because your theology is based on conclusion. You have conclusion-based theology and conclusion-based labels. You shouldn't have either one of those. I was on Leighton Flower's show not long ago where we talked about labels and why we should have them. When you look at the four kinds of knowing, which are right over here, you have propositional, procedural, perspective, perspectival participatory all of our labels and doctrine are there in propositional 
That is bad. That is not good. Now, we cannot communicate without propositions, so I'm not saying that, that propositions are bad. What I'm saying is that our practice of Christianity residing only there is bad. Okay? So if we have a label for what we do, if you have a good proposition, what did you do to get it? You had a good procedure to get that proposition, a good process, a good interpretive process, a good interpretive methodology that got you that proposition. So if you have a good procedure, you can get a good proposition. So you don't need to have theology based on propositions at all. You just need to have you just need to have correct procedures, and then you will know that you will always be able to generate good propositions on the fly, you see? And if you want to be called a label, don't be called a label up here, like a Calvinist, Arminian, or a Provisionist. Be called a label up here, like an inductive method practitioner, something like that. Be labeled by the process that you follow. I'm a follower of Jesus, the way. There's a movement to it, you see? There's nothing stagnant and still and stale about it. So, um, when we come back, I don't know when that'll be. Maybe tomorrow night. Probably not tomorrow night. <laughs> maybe Thursday. Maybe Thursday. We will come back and we're going to discuss some more of these. The dragons that underlie Calvinism. Now, let me look and say here. Let me look at some of these comments down here. So many good comments. Calvinism and its surrounding even more widespread bad epistemic practices is one of the greatest mimetic hazards to Christianity. True. Quoting scripture is what all are called to do when speaking on Bible doctrines. Um, let's see here. What other comments do I have? I can't display these because I didn't prepare to display them ahead of time, even though I probably should have done that. He's not speaking specifically on doctrines. That's correct. I'm not speaking specifically on doctrines. I'm speaking on the propensity of humans as data processors to be deceived into believing certain kinds of doctrines. So what's our relationship to doctrines? Yeah, thought patterns. That's right, behavior. What beliefs do people uh, do to people and how they think or behave? Yep. Aaron says, people like you are literally the reason Kevin needs videos like this <laughs> up at Street 8. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably true. I didn't see all of that, but yeah, that's probably true. He's used scripture and Calvinists have, there is made up interpretations, which is why scripture doesn't work. So, so yeah, what he's saying, what I think he's saying is that it's not that scripture is powerless or anything like that, is that there's, Calvinists don't even know what their interpretation methodology is. If you ask a Calvinist face-to-face -face what interpretation methodology do you use, they won't be able to tell you. If you ask them on the internet, they will go Google it at one of their Calvinist websites and they'll come back and say, we follow the redemptive historic method, which means to say that means they don't understand the relationship between presuppositions and sense making. So they have no idea what's going on there. Um, Calvinism does not belong in Christianity. That is true. Calvinism is a para it has a parasitic relationship with Christianity. It's something like a parasite, like a worm, or like cancer to the body of Christ. <clears throat> Let's see what else do we have here? Can't read all these. <laughs> and some of them are kind of funny. Uh, so this guy, Street 8, said, he is saying things of no value on this matter because Scripture is king. Well, I've already addressed this issue. Calvinists, um, they will say sola scripture and that Scripture is king, but then they will say things like, sovereignty is the pillow on which we rest our head, whereby we get peace from God. What Scripture do you find that out of? <laughs> you know, they don't believe Scripture. They don't believe what Scripture says. How, how about um, he is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You guys don't believe a word in that Bible. Um, as many as were pointed to eternal life, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, right? You think that supports Calvinism, but you are inserting the phrase by God. And God is not the subject of any verb in that sentence. And you didn't even realize that because why? Scripture is not your authority after all. 
You have your ideas and you're imposing them onto scripture. Scripture is not king to you. So what that brings up, that brings up the interpretation methodology. So the difference, we, we agree verbally on what the authority is, but we interpret it differently. What we do as non-Calvinists is we let the scripture speak for itself. Calvinists have an output. Every, every Calvinism has to... Ha, Calvinism only exists where there was previous influence of Calvinism because it came from outside Christianity from Manny, Manichaean Gnosticism, through August, Augustine. And then he relied back on that when he was in a rivalrous dynamic that he didn't know his Bible well enough to handle properly. Okay, So then that rivalrous dynamic brought out a set of doctrines that perpetuated itself. And ever since then, people have been reading the output of that rivalrous dynamic back into Scripture, which is called eisegesis, to put things into Scripture rather than what we should be doing, which is to draw things out of Scripture. Okay, So the interpretation methodology really needs to be looked at there. Um, scripture is not king if you are a Calvinist. Calvinism is another way of rejecting Scripture. Okay. Um, Gerard says Calvinism or Arminianism are Hegelian dialects of the same coin. Second Corinthians two eleven. Lest Satan should get advantage of us, for we're not ignorant ignorant of his devices. Yes, Calvinism, Arminianism, same thing. Joe Carter says I completely agree. Scripture is our final authority, not emotions. Uh, think of all those who respond emotionally to truth. Cain and Abel, Esau, Jacob, Joseph, his brethren, Moses, Pharaoh. That's a good comment there. And several other of these that others others can go through. <laughs> this might be lost on him, brother. That's that's true. Vet everything yourself. That's all he's saying. Be a Berean. All right. Um I think you can still appeal to some authority, but you need to examine their teachings. Yes, that is true too. Sanji says, because here's the deal. The world is combinatorially explosive and you can't study everything. But what you can do sometimes is you can look at other people who've studied it. And one of the, one of the things you might consider doing is get experts who disagree on a matter and then find out what the, what the center of their disagreement is. Okay, and try to get to the get to the heart of that, and then hold them both in possibility space. It was never in Christianity. It was never anything more than an illegitimate child of Catholicism. It is the same approach towards Scripture, non-literal. All right, that's a good point too. A lot of good comments here. I, I wish I could read all the comments, but we're going to go ahead and wrap up the video. I appreciate everybody participating and uh, watching. And viewing share this video with other people if you want people to see this information that's very important that you share these um, so we can get the word out we want this channel to grow so that more people become aware of it and so that Christians can be informed about what's really going on we want more Christians to know what what's the dragon underneath underneath this what's the you know what's the shorted out electrical line behind the walls Calvinism is just the light bulb that won't turn on. Calvinism is just the water on the floor. We keep wiping that up. What's the real issue behind the scenes? That's what we're talking about. This, this stuff is, this stuff has to pre-exist where Calvinism spreads. It has to. And without these problems, without people being dysregulated in these areas, there would be no Calvinism. Or there would be no other kind of false doctrine either. So we're going to stop here for tonight and we'll pick back up next time and do some more of these. Maybe we'll have a couple people on and do a little discussion on some of these. That'll be kind of fun. So uh, thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.